What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Web3 SQL Weekly number five, where I break down queries into bite-sized bits. This week, we're going to be looking at the hot topic of Bitcoin NFTs or ordinals or inscriptions, clear up all the confusion around it and talk about how you calculate mints. Don't forget that there's a newsletter version of this video in the description below, and you can vote and submit queries for the weeks after from the canny board in the link below. Uh, it's important to know if you don't know anything about Bitcoin, if you don't know what a UTXO is, if you don't know what inputs and outputs are, um, I highly recommend you read this article on screen first. It'll take you through all the basics and that'll make this week's material much, much easier for you to learn. So let's get into it. Cool. So if you want just like a historical overview of like how Bitcoin NFTs came to be, I highly recommend you read Dennis's newsletter article shown here which I will link in my newsletter article. All right, so the first thing we need to clear up is Bitcoin NFT versus ordinal versus inscription. So let's start with ordinals. So ordinal is ordinal theory, and that's just a made up way of tracking Satoshis so that these Satoshis are essentially token IDs from Ethereum land. You can track a Satoshi, which is one to the eight decimals of Bitcoin, starting from the block it was mined in. So you're essentially literally saying, okay, 50 Bitcoins were mined in this block. The first one is sat one, the second one is sat two. And then you use this first in, first out tracking method for each transaction to then say, this Satoshi was in the first input. That means it should go in the first output as well. You can actually find that the 20 line Python script that defines how this is calculated is in the BIP of the repo uh, for ordinals. That's how you track Satoshis. And there's a bunch of like ordinal notation of like then showing it as degrees or showing it with this kind of like cycle or clock system. You can represent it as like a hashed name as well, but they all essentially tie to that Satoshi like sat token ID. And these are NFTs, right? But these are NFTs without content or these are NFTs that haven't been inscribed with content yet. So that gets us into inscriptions, which you can just go to this link here and say, see, oh, if there's this set of scripts that are used in the witness data of an input, then the Satoshi in that input is now inscribed with this content. So it's very much, again, a made up standard of, oh, if you do this, then the inscription tracker that like, these people built is going to recognize it as an inscription. Again, the theme you'll see here is a lot of this is made up and like socially accepted versus like on Ethereum, you deploy a contract and it's trustlessly accepted. But nonetheless, you can inscribe a Satoshi or an ordinal multiple times. It can't be removed after it's subscribed. You could accidentally transfer it, but the inscription stays with it forever. So like looking at an example here, if I look here, this was one of the inscriptions that took up four megabytes or basically the whole block. You can see that they inscribed this JPEG here. And if I look at the transaction, let's just copy this into Blockstream, which is the ether scan of, of Bitcoin. You'll see that there's this very long witness data here. And essentially this is the inscription and witness data is not actually stored on chain because it's just supposed to be a signature. This gets into the whole taproot thing that Dennis explains in his article. We're going to talk about how we identify this script here, because once you identify this script, then you're able to identify a, a mint and I'm counting a mint as an inscription. So when an ordinal or a sat is inscribed, that's a mint. Even if the same ordinals inscribed twice, that's still two mints. That's not a single mint. So it's very important you understand this wording. All right. So without further ado, let's recreate this query. So let's get into the query. You can see it's a pretty short query, but there's actually a lot that goes behind the scenes. And let's start by just looking at an example transaction. So this was the inscription I was just showing off earlier. Let's take this ID and let's start a new query. Let's go to the Dune engine and we're going to select all from Bitcoin transactions. 
where the ID equals. I remember that we add a 0x prefix just so that it works better in our database, but technically there is none. And we want where the block height is equal to uh, here. All right, so this is the block it was mined in, but you can see there's an ID. And then this is basically already just showing us the hex, All right? Better way of looking into what's going on here is if I just go to Bitcoin here and then preview the table, um, you'll see there's a hash, there's an ID, there's a hex, which is all the data in the transaction. And we're going to come back to that. And then there's input and output as well. So technically what we're looking for is the witness data of the input. If you checked here earlier, this is the witness data of the input. Specifically, it's the second signature, right? So this is the first signature and this is the second one. So the way we would get that is we would say, all right, I want the input the first input, and then I want the witness data number two. So this is going to get me this 0x20a7 thing, which is this 200a7 thing, right? If you want, you could select this straight out of inputs as well. This input is already nicely decoded for you and unnested, which means when a transaction has multiple inputs, there's a row per input. But we can actually cheat because we know this input data is within hex. We don't have to look at the witness data, but it's good to know mentally that witness data is where this is coming from. So what do we want to recognize when this inscription is being used? So the way we can do that is we essentially want to decode when we see this set of commands, right? Because you might not know what content type is being pushed uh, and you definitely know what contents itself is being pushed. So. Let's change this into hex code, right? Into bytes. So the way we can do this is we can look at the opcodes, uh, which is like the lowest level of programmability in Bitcoin. And it's used across like a large number of, and this is the Dune documentation, a large number of columns such as like hex. Basically, it's how you program anything in Bitcoin. So if I look at the scripts here, I can see, okay, OP false is zero, zero, right? So... I'm going to start by saying zero and the next op code here. Let me just put these next to each other. The next op code is OP if, all right. So if I just do an OP if search here, it's 63, all right? So zero, zero, six, three, and then there's an OP push of ORD. So. This is OP push bytes, technically. So we actually don't know what hex it is just yet, but we do know that they always push ORD. So what that means is I need to figure out what is the hex representation of ORD. So the way to do this is we're going to take it from this ORD string into a hex decimal form. So I think what we need to do is we need to change it to UTF-8. So we want to change it to its binary form, and then we want to change it to hex. And these are just Trino specific functions. So if I do select and I only select here, you're going to see, I get this six F seven, two, six, four thing. So I now know that it's pushing three bytes, right? Cause there's two characters in a byte. So if it's pushing three bytes, then that means that it should be the zero X zero three hex code being used. So this should be zero three, right? So now all that's left is I know there's an OP one and then another push. So I know is just zero one. So let's add a zero one here. So this is what we're looking for. And if I look here, you'll actually see, oh, it matches something here. This is literally the inscription standard being matched. There's actually another zero one included here as well before the like push bytes of the content type. I don't exactly know where that comes from, but I know there's always two zero ones just from looking at the data. So this is the string we're trying to match. Uh, and I'm going to change this F to a lowercase just because our hex is stored in lowercase. So we want to match where and and hex is this string. So what the like function does is it says, hey, given some string, check if this is contained within the string. 
And these percentage symbols just mean that anything can come before or after. So if I run this, I'm going to comment this out for now. If I run this, I should still see an output. It shouldn't say no results. Cool. So I can see it still came through, which means that this was matched. So technically, I could just count the number of times this is matched, and this will give me the mints. But I'm interested in the content type as well. And this is what makes the, the query a little trickier, because essentially I know that there's some bytes pushed, and then that those bytes pushed can be translated from hex back into UTF-8 to give me the actual content type. So how do we do this? Let's first say I need to know essentially three steps. I need to know the amount of bytes pushed. And then if I know that, then I can take a substring of hex from end of ORD standard, so end of this block, to length of bytes. And then after that, we're going to do, we're going to do a from hex and then I believe a from UTF. Oops. On this whole thing. Just checking here. Yeah. Converting it from hex and then to UTF-8. Logically, that makes sense. What does that look like in practice? So we need to do... First, we need to do a, re, a, a regex, which is basically finding the position in which this string was detected. So I'm saying, all right. I want the position that this was found in within hex, right? As starting point. So I start with this. And you can see starting point is character number 397, but that's the start of this. And this character string is 16 characters long, All right? So I want to add a plus 16 here as my starting point. All right, so let's do substring of the hex column starting from here, and we're going to want the next two characters. And now this is no longer starting point, this is bytes pushed. And that's 0a, right? And you might be like, 0a, what's that? That's not like a, it's not like a nice 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So we have our handy dandy hex to number calculator here, and you can see the hex to number here is 10, All right? So that means that 10 was the length of the content pushed. So how do we check that? So to check that, we're going to take, all right, I have my starting position. I have my bytes pushed. This is the length I want, but I need it in numeric form. So I'm going to use byte array to integer, which is a custom Dune SQL function that changes this like hex form into an integer form. So this should give me 10. Oh, we require zero X in front. You can see it's 10 bytes pushed. So this means our total content is we take the substring of hex and we want to start from this starting position, but 18 instead of 16, right? Because we want the starting position of the actual content. This was 16 because we wanted the bytes pushed. We wanted essentially, we wanted this 0a. Now we want this like six something next 10 bytes, which is next 20 characters. So I'm going to say, hey, this is starting point of content. And then for this, we need to multiply by two to get number of characters. This is number of characters and content type. And now this is content hex. Cannot apply var car times integer. Oh, I needed a parentheses. And what else are we missing here? Probably missing a parentheses. Is this one close? Yeah, so that's an extra parentheses. Let's run it again. You're going to see this is our content hex, right? So this was the next 20 bytes 
following this. So just summarizing, we got everything up to here. We first figured out how many bytes were pushed and that gives us the length of the content. But you'll notice that our content is in hex form. It's not in text form. So this is why we need to then convert it from hex to binary. And then we want to convert it from binary to UTF-8, which is just human readable. And you'll see we get image JPEG. So this is exactly what we wanted. Now we're basically almost done. All we need to do now is let's just do a date trunk by week of block time as week. And then this is now content type. And we want the count. So we don't have this anymore. We don't need to filter by specific transaction anymore. And now I'm just going to do a group by one, two. We're going to remove this as well. And you can see there's a ton of content types here. I'm just going to graph by count and then group by content type. We're going to stack it and you're going to see, all right, this is way too many to be legible, but you'll notice that they all have a slash, right? It's some main type slash subtype. And so to make this more readable, we're going to split by delimiter, right? So we're going to split everything by slash, which is then basically going to give us an array of like application comma JSON, for example. And we only want the first element of the array, just because this is much more human readable for, for us to actually interpret what's going on. Cool. So now you see the queries ran and it's much, much cleaner now to only look at the top. There are some other queries I've made that make you, that allow you to search by all content types with subtypes, but this is essentially how you track ordinal mints more inscriptions. So. If you're wondering, wow, this is very different from Ethereum analysis, it is. I think a lot of Bitcoin analysis requires you to understand what the common script pattern or standard is. And then you just have to query and be like, okay, I'm looking for this like multi-sig script standard. So I have to figure out the pattern of scripts that represent a multi-sig. And then I query for that within like the hex code of a transaction. And it gets much more complicated than that when you have multiple inputs and outputs, but ordinals are actually a fairly good introduction to like analyzing scripts on Bitcoin. So hopefully that all makes sense. You've learned now how to do basic analysis with Bitcoin data and now what the heck people mean when they say Bitcoin NFTs or ordinals or inscriptions. Bonus question, if you can figure out how to write in SQL that like 20 line Bitcoin script earlier for tracking ordinals, please let me know. I'm still trying to figure this out if there's a way to do this in pure SQL. So this week I'm leaving it open-ended. If you figure it out, I will find some bounty to pay you. But other than that, make sure you check the newsletter, make sure to vote and submit for next week's query, and I will see you all later.